Hey everyone, how's everybody doing today? Uh, it's Sunshine Christina here. I hope everyone's well. Um, I uh, thought I'd make a video today and discuss a couple of different things. Um, one of the things that I want to make sure that I talk about is um, the Richard Glossop case. Um, just Rhonda had sent me a petition in that uh, to sign for Richard Glossop to try and get him off a of death row. He's been on there um, since I think 1997 and he is innocent um, in my opinion clearly innocent and um, I uh, yeah, at that point I was at the motel. I knew that he left this, around 9. This is an interview, Justin Sneed. Now, um, okay, first let me give you a brief overview of the Richard Glossop case. Richard Glossop was arrested and charged with orchestrating the first degree murder of a, I believe it took place in Oklahoma City, um, a motel owner by the name of Barry Vantrees. And what happened was the pretty much I think within 12 or 14 hours of Barry Van Treese's body being found in um, one of his motel rooms, I think it was room 102, um, officers singled, you know, kind of tunneled or uh, honed in on a, a kid named J Justin Seed, who was a worker, a part time worker at the motel. And he had a major drug problem. I think he was addicted to crystal meth. And he um, was arrested. And he was pretty much told by investigators that, um, you know, Richard's saying you did it. And we think Richard's involved. And if you don't tell us you know, that he was involved, then you're going to go, you're going to die for this. We're going to put you on death row for this crime. Now, um, that's kind of an overview on it. Um, one of the DAs involved in this case, because this case took place in Oklahoma City in the um, late 90s, is Bob Macy. And we all know how um, much of an asshole and I think he was a psychopath Bob Macy was um, he truly enjoyed putting people on death row and uh, we know that he's put innocent people on death row um, and you know and um, he's also done a lot of other just abhorrent things and I think he was eventually um, just Rhonda has some videos on Bob Macy I think he was eventually disbarred um, prior to his death but so Richard Glossop um, there's absolutely no evidence tying Richard Glossop to any of this the brutal murder um, Barry Van Treese was beat to death with a baseball bat I think he was stabbed in his chest and his back um, there are rumors that Justin Sneed's girlfriend um, was there at the time of Barry Van Treese's murder. There's also rumors that I guess there was a strip club and um, next to this motel. And there's rumors that girls that danced at the club would... Um, would make dates for sexual acts for money um, at the motel and while they brought the customer into the room and while they were getting busy Justin Sneed would break in and rob them and this was like some kind of a hustle he had worked out with the girls um, ahead of time 
and I think also Justin Sneed's um, girlfriend, I'm not sure if I mentioned that or not, was a dancer at the motel. So it's very likely that she had, um, you know, her and Barry Van Treese had decided to, you know, perform sex for money and Justin Sneed attacked him during that act and killed him and took, robbed him for money for drugs. Um, there are several people who have claimed Justin Sneed has admitted to them that he and he alone is responsible for this crime. More concerning than that is the state of Oklahoma has gone after these people and violated their probation, charged them with crimes um, to get them to try and change their story. Um, let's see, what else do I want to mention? I cannot find in any document where Justin Sneed's girlfriend's name is mentioned. There is a mention of her stage name or street name and uh, um, I find that very interesting. Also interesting is Richard Glossop's attorneys have tried for years to get access to this evidence. Um, there is um, broken glass, I think, from the window that got broke out of Hotel Room 102 that they have tried to get to um, have DNA tested um, to try and determine who else was in the room because it wasn't Richard. Um, and um, they, the DA's office, like, like we see in all wrongful convictions, have just been you know, absolutely, um, their behavior has been the exact opposite of what you would expect to see if justice and the truth is what you were really after. Now, um, some things about Richard Glossop. He has been on death row, I believe since 97, like I said, he has had a death date three times. He has... He has also had his last meal three times. He orders the same thing. This is kind of like a novelty thing for a true crime. Um, is to talk about the last meal um, of a, a prisoner who's about to be executed. And Richard Glossop orders the same thing every time. He gets a Baconator from Wendy's, fish and chips, a strawberry shake, and pizza. Once he got Pizza Hut, twice he got Domino's. He's, um, he has listened to two men be put to death and, um, this article I think is dated August of 2021, yep, August 20th, um, and it is saying that he could be up to have a death date again this year, 2022. Now he was 35 when he was arrested and had never been in trouble in his life. Um, um, let's see, Sister Helen Prejean is part of his um, advocacy team and works with his attorney. He had worked for Barry Van Treese for two years. Oh, it was the best budget in. Um, and the state's theory of the crime is that two years after Van, Barry Van Trees had hired Richard Glossop, he began noticing that the books seemed to be off, and he suspected Richard Glossop, who was in charge of the payroll, had was stealing roughly about six thousand dollars. Um, and he was going to confront and possibly fire him. Now remember, this is the state's theory. Justin Sneed was Richard Glossop's buddy and pal and kind of like a kid brother. And Richard Glossop went to him early on the morning of January 7th and told him to kill Van Treats, promising him $10,000 for the job, plus a gig managing one of the hotels the boss owned. Now, think about the idiocy of this statement. Who thinks that in America, if you kill the owner of the hotel, you get to take over their business? 
because I don't. I think if you kill someone who owns a business, that business then goes to their wife or spouse, unless you're the spouse and you're killing them. But an employee, I can't go to work one day, say, I hate my boss. I'm going to kill him and take over his business and think I'm going to get away with it. I mean, that's just absurd. So obviously they had no motive. Um, let's see. Now, there's a couple of odd things I want to make sure that I mention. Barry Vantrese's vehicle had been moved from the hotel to right down the street. And, and it was parked in a bank parking lot. Um, and unbeknownst to Justin Sneed, there was $21,000 in the trunk of Barry Van Treese's car. And a lot of that money was covered in dye, like from a bank robbery. And oddly enough, Oklahoma City never... The police or the DA's office never really tried to figure out where that money came from. So a couple of things that that all of this information should tell us is that Barry Vantrese, obviously, even though he was a family man and had children, and this in no way makes what happened to him okay. Barry Vantrese obviously lead, led a double life. Right, He was a married man, but he also owned a hotel in a seedy part of town next to a strip club. He liked to enjoy the services of the girls at the strip club who also traded, you know, did sex for cash, which I don't knock that as a profession um, at all. I'm just making a statement. Um, don't come for me over that. Um, and Barry Van Treese also was obviously into risky endeavors that, um, with, you know, the people who commit crimes. Why else would he have 20, in excess of $20,000 in cash in the trunk of his vehicle covered in dye from a bank robbery? So, and none of that is ever really mentioned. And we see that a lot in wrongful convictions. The victim is put up on this pedestal and presented as someone they're clearly not, right? And, you know, that's not a judgment. It's just a statement. They do that in the Teresa Haubach case. They completely fabricate this life for Teresa that is nothing like the life she was living. Um, and what other cases have we seen it in? Oh, the... Adam Gray case, it's mentioned in that as well. Um, a case out of Chicago that was a wrongful conviction for a teenager. So, let's see. Um, now, I want to play, let's play some of, this is Justin Sneed's interview. Now, he got life in prison. So he was... You okay? Can you, can you take me back to 1997 and talk just a little bit about how well, you're talking about? I mean, for the most part of it, it's the same as I told the juries to their attorneys selecting the questions that they chose to select at the moment. Um, it still goes back to the same factors that Mr. Glossop um, co-horsed me and, and pleaded with me for over three months um, and the numerous amounts of money that he was offering me kept changing um, up to a point to um, to that night in that incident where like I said he came to my room around 3, 3.30 in the morning and just you know I mean as irate as he was and kind of stuff like that I can understand that that Mr. Van Treese probably was there to jam him up on some money, which is, That's you know, what the victims, I guess, supposedly claim. I never knew that at, um, at the time. I didn't know that, you know, Ms. Van Treese and then people would claim that, you know, they were there to jam him up over some money that was due on the books or whatever. You didn't know Richard had been yeah, I didn't. Okay, so what's funny about that is now remember, the prosecution is claiming that um, 
Barry Van Trees had noticed that Richard Glossop was stealing money from the hotel, and so he was going to fire him. So Richard Glossop went to Justin Sneed and said, I'm going to get fired for stealing money. I want you to kill Barry Van Trees, and I will give you $10,000 and give you a hotel to run. Remember that. And yet, he never mentions the hotel to run. He doesn't mention the stealing the money. And I didn't know what his motivation was. See? Um, other than, yeah, he kept begging and pleading me until the point that he literally pushed me over an edge, right? So. Um, so we're going to get this money, we're going to this money, and said, I'm going to give you money? No, he said he was going to pay me money. It didn't have nothing to do. The whole split in the money didn't come to the end to where I realized, okay, you know, the, the Mr. Van Trees was the one with the money and that's where he was getting the money. And um, so that already doesn't make any sense. And also, um, Justin Sneed was running from uh, warrants in Texas. He was beating up um, for burglary and stuff like that. There are several different people who knew Justin Sneed prior to his incarceration who said that he would steal anything that wasn't bolted to the floor. Um, and then when I, I got the money and brought it back to my room is when he decided he wanted to take half of it. Of course, then just keeping me held on promises that he could never... Uh, now, see, that also contradicts what the district attorney said because the district attorney said that Richard Glossop was going to pay him $10,000, right? And now Justin Sneed is saying that he stole money from Barry Van Trees after he beat him to death and Richard Glossop took half of that money. So none of that makes sense. It just doesn't... Keep it clean. Uh... Yeah, that's... How do you feel? There's been a lot last week with everything that's happened. Um, you see the headlines that say, oh, he might be innocent, he might be, you know, like maybe he's innocent. And, you know, we've talked about whether you, yeah. you didn't have any choice and then deciding to, to go after the death penalty for him. That wasn't your choice. They just told you that if you testify, you won't get it. Um, is that what they told you? If you testify against Richard, then you pro pro pretty much won't get it? Yeah, that was, is what, is what that boiled down to was... Um, after talking with the cops and trusting the cops that they were truly going to help me when they were asking me and then I started coming forth with the truth thinking okay these are the cops they're older that's what their job is is to help people and, and doing nothing but making me false promises the same way he was making me false promises but I let the truth be known and then after I spoke the truth I never decided to change the truth um, even to my now that's funny because his story has changed repeatedly over the years um he's never had a consistent story it's always it's never the same from start to finish and if it had actually happened the way the prosecution said it happened that would be the story but he, both the prosecution and Justin Sneed have changed how this crime occurred which is very common. Um, I will link this in the description for um, anyone who wants to watch it in its entirety. It's a pretty interesting video because it, it really shows just how evil this guy is, right? These are um, Richard Glossop's defenders. This is Sister Helen Perjean. Um, and this is Don Knight. That's his main attorney. And there was a couple of other things I wanted to make sure I read. Um, oh, David Prater, which if you go to just Rhonda's YouTube channel is now the DA on this case. And he is full. He has his own issues. Um, her videos will explain that, but he's he's not an ethical DA by any means. Um, he released a statement that 
Richard Glossop has exercised and exhausted every constitutional and statutory right as he has gone through the trial process at both the state and federal appellate process. Every court has reviewed his claim and have denied him any relief. And once again, EDPA is the reason why there's not much that can be done. Um, and there was a recent article about EDPA um, that was actually linked um, by the Innocence Project discussing the decision in the Melissa Lucio case. And there, I just wanted... Here's an example. In 2011, this is why EDPA, something has to be done with EDPA. Um, and for those of you who don't know, EDPA is the anti, let's see if they, I don't want to mess it up. EDPA is the anti-terrorism act that was put in place um, after Timothy McVeigh um, it was passed in Congress and the Senate after Timothy McVeigh bombed the Oklahoma City building, FBI building, and um, the purpose was to shorten the time between sentencing and death, um, but it really gutted habeas corpus relief. It relies heavily on the state courts doing the right thing, right? It basically ham handcuffs the federal court from being able to offer relief on in state cases so here's some examples of where edpa has kept um the supreme court from helping uh, grant relief to innocent people in 2011 the supreme court overturned a ruling in the u.s court of appeals for the ninth Cir circuit that a woman convicted of murdering her grandson with discredited shaken baby syndrome evidence should get a new trial. The high court declared that although the woman might well be innocent, that wasn't something for the federal courts to decide. I mean, that's just absurd. In 2000, two Chicago area men were convicted of the same crime with the exact same evidence. New evidence later emerged that should have exculpated both, but only one was exonerated. The other man was prevented by the Wisconsin, why am I not surprised, Supreme Court from challenging his conviction. The former is now a prominent attorney, the latter a registered sex offender. That's insane. In 2016, when a Texas judge ruled for the state in a crucial dispute over the legality of a man's death sentence, she didn't write her own opinion. Instead, she adopted the prosecution's brief word for word and put her name on it. Now, that's funny because we see that in Stephen Avery's case with Suckowitz um, and the Court of Appeals. Both of them used almost verbatim excerpts from the prosecutor's um, responses or the prosecutor's brief. And it's worse, this Texas judge issued her ruling before the defense could file its own brief with new evidence, which means she couldn't have read it. Again, the federal courts refused to intervene. And we see that in Stephen Avery's case as well, when Zellner filed a over 1,300 page petition and Suckowitz denied it in what, three weeks? There's no way she would take nine months to rule on a 20 page petition. And she took three weeks to read, comprehend, research, and weigh the evidence in a 1,300 page post conviction relief motion. I'm bullshit didn't happen. The failures in these cases all originated in state courts. 
Under our system, when a state violates the constitutional protections of a fair trial, the federal courts are required to intervene. The right to judicial review of an unlawful detention, also known as the writ of habeas corpus, is enshrined in the Constitution and dates back to 13th century England. But in 1996, Congress took a chisel to habeas corpus with the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, a.k.a. EDPA. Attorneys who represent people challenging their convictions, such as Mississippi's Humphreys McGee, say that EDPA and the Supreme Court rulings that followed have suffocated federal view. It's been a 25-year thicket of real through-the-looking-glass shit, McGee says, and the law's repeal or reform is long overdue. The EDPA came several years after a spike in crime that began in the early 80s and peaked around 91. By the time of EDPA, by the time that EDPA, EDPA became law, blah, 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 crime rates were in the first years, few years of a 20-year freefall. But the two major parties were in a frenzied competition over who could look toughest on suspected criminals. This was Bush and Clinton stuff. The bill also came shortly after the New Greenwich-led Republican Revolution, a movement built on law and order rhetoric and promises to devolve more power to the states. This is also when they started building a lot of privatized prisons and the prison for profit, you know, kind of started getting its momentum. And it's, it's very, the more that you learn about the criminal justice system and how it's become a money-making avenue for states, not only states, but for uh, elected people who are supposed to be advocating for justice and the truth, um, and that they are actually financially um, profiting from the locking up of criminals. Um, it's a problem. It's a problem. Um, it's not supposed to be about finances. It's not supposed to be about financial gain. It's not supposed to be about political power. It's supposed to be about truth and justice, right? That's why she has a blindfold on. Um, because she's supposed to be blind to any bias, blind to anything but the truth. And justice has not been blind in many, many years in America. At the same time, early DNA testing had begun to show the criminal justice system was far more fallible than commonly thought. The technology was young. By the end of 95, DNA had exonerated just 37 people, but even then those cases raised questions about the reliability of forensic evidence and eyewitness testimony and the behavior of police and prosecutors. Innocence projects sprang up around the country and law schools established clinics to seek out other bad cases. According to the National Registry of Exonerations, in the 213 years before the first DNA exoneration in 1989, the U.S. saw a total of 418 exonerations. In the 32 years since, there have been 2,733. That's insane. Yet at the same time, DNA should have forced us to confront the shortcomings of the criminal justice system that EDPA all but slammed the federal courthouse door closed to the wrongfully convicted. The EDPA's most destructive provision is arguably its deference to state courts. And what that means is that it always has to refer back to the state court. So. A federal court previously could review constitutional claims without considering state court's previous rulings. EDPA requires federal judges to defer to state courts even if they believe those courts are wrong. In fact, the Supreme Court has essentially ruled that to be overturned, 
a state court ruling must be so unreasonable that its judges are unfit to sit on the bench. And there's no way a judge is going to say another judge is unfit to serve. It's just not going to happen. Because for the most part, I watched a video of Rippers the other day and he said that if you take a hundred criminal cases, 97 of them are pled out. Only three go to trial. Okay. So most people can't afford to take a case to trial. They just can't. It's expensive. It's inherently expensive. You can work your whole life, save money and either get targeted, have a mistake, something occur and get caught up in a criminal case. Let's say you have, you've worked your whole life and you have $250,000 in the bank, okay? And you are wrongly charged of murdering someone. Someone thought they saw you at the scene of a crime. Um, the cops have tunnel visioned and um, they are just bound and determined they're going to prosecute you for something you didn't do. Or, you can take a 10-year suspended sentence and get back to your life. Now, what do you do? A good murder attorney, a good criminal defense attorney to provide you a defense on a first or on a manslaughter murder charge is at minimum, minimum a hundred thousand dollars. Minimum. Minimum. Or you can take a plea, never serve a day in jail, do some probation. You're not a criminal anyway, and go on with your life and keep your money. Most people are just going to say, fuck it. I mean, they are because it's not worth the time. Because not only are you taking money from your savings, you're also losing money from work. The energy, and, and it's just not worth it. Then you have to worry about the media getting hold of it, it getting out in the paper, your kids being harassed. So people just cave and they they will say they're guilty of a crime they didn't do. Actually, they'll say they'll plead no contest and then they're convicted and then it's over. And this is why, because the courts are so backwards in their thinking that the truth and justice have long, long been lost. It's about making money and it's about solving problems. Like with Stephen Avery's case, it's about looking tough on crime in cases where crimes don't occur, like Melissa Lucio's case. It's about um, just, you know, pretending that everything's fine and good to the community and we pro we prosecute criminals and we're policing our streets when the reality is you know crime is is on the rise drug use is on the rise um and you're simply you know getting convictions on cases to make the stats look good but you're not you don't have the money to investigate properly or you don't care to investigate properly and you're charging people that didn't do the crimes that you're saying they did. And EDPA prevents any relief if you're ever convicted. Um, it's just a vicious circle. Richard Glossop is innocent. Um, and I hope that he somehow gets off death row. But in the three years that I've been searching wrongful convictions, I'm going to tell you right now. As much as I want to have faith that Stephen and Brendan will be released, Richard Glossop will be released, Daniel Holtzclaw will be released, Melissa Lucio will be released, uh, Darlie Rudier will be released. Um, who else is there? I know there's more out there. Oh, Nicole Bacchus will be released. A part of me knows that... <laughs> yeah, this is a smart-ass comment. That this is a pipe dream that I can use Joe Biden's meth pipe to smoke and and dream about it happening, right? Um, because the reality is 
that nobody wants to admit they're wrong. Nobody wants to pay someone what they're rightfully owed for what's been done to them. And nobody wants to legislate funding to fix the most destructive piece of legislation to be passed in trying to free the wrongfully convicted. So I'll link this article as well. And um, I'm also going to link the petition um, to sign for Richard Glossop, the petition for Melissa Lucio. And um, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them down below. And if you um, like my content, please hit like and subscribe. And thanks for watching.